please welcome Dr. Alice Tunier. Thank you, Dagita. So thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, yeah, so many of you, I, you know, it's like, cool. I didn't <laughs> when you're invited, you never know. And um, as Peter said, Sweden has been a country where we've heard that there's difficulties. So it's, uh, it's great to see so many of you. Um, so the topic for today, I, I'm giving a talk today and tomorrow. So today I wanted to, to tell you about um, some of the physics I've been looking at in terms of explaining homeopathy and to tell you about where, um, what I think are the kind of the ingredients that we need to look at in terms of a physical theory. But before I go there, I just wanted to do a quick plug for uh, the Homeopathy Research Institute. Uh, I'm aware most of you don't know who we are. Uh, so we are currently a UK-based charity uh, dedicated to doing high-quality research into homeopathy. Uh, so what we, the way we work is often to help researchers network to make sure that protocols are the highest quality possible, that people have all the, the support they need to make sure people publish in the highest journals possible, and so on and so on. Uh, so we make the link between donors and, and projects. Another aspect of what we do is to communicate about the research, to make sure that people understand the, the, the research in homeopathy. Uh, so that's a big aim of the charity, make sure that it's, it's understandable, that people are aware, communicate with uh, the public. And uh, if you want to hear more about it, then talk to me. And actually, one of our trustees is here with us, uh, Peter Vixman, uh, over there. So you can catch him if you want to uh, talk some more about the HRI. And please sign up to our, to our newsletter. We send uh, newsletters every uh, three months right now with kind of a, a, um, a digest, a new scientist type articles about re research topics. So um, now I'm going to have to plug myself because um, uh, in a few talks lately, people have just been questioning, well, you're a homeopath, what do you know about physics? So actually, I do know about physics. I did my bachelor's uh, in, in London. I studied theoretical physics in Cambridge. Uh, I did my PhD in, in water structures in Heidelberg. Uh, and then became a homeopath as well. And I have been uh, just about 10 years working as a consultant in maths and physics for Cancer Research UK in, the, in London. So um, I, I think I can talk about physics with some degree of confidence. Um, it, it, I had a really pointy question, so once so now I've put this slide. Um, so uh, I'd like to really move on to homeopathy. And for this talk, I'd really like you to stop me and ask questions. Like, I know that the, the policy is wait until the end. For my talk, please, just go for it. You know, think it's a classroom, because if, if you're lost, it's not good for me. Uh, so I'd rather you ask your questions immediately, because then it will have a good discussion. So really, two, two problems with homeopathy that we can see. The, the laws of similars and the laws of uh, the minimum dose. The law of similars, basically, uh, we know that if you have a, a, a complex system, such as the human body or any biological system that's always going to be adapting to, in, to its environment, then you could have, uh, could induce a reaction in the system by some stimulation, such as homeopathy. So, so the, the, the principle of activation through a vaccine or through the anti-allergy um, um, injections, that kind of is established. That is, we know how to trigger a reaction in a complex system to get the system back to health. So this is not well researched yet, this whole area of, of similars, but, in, but conceptually it's already kind of out there in conventional medicine, and conceptually we could see how we could go forward in establishing you know, proof of this principle, how you get a complex system to go towards health. 
Now, the big problem we've had with homeopathy is really the, the minimum dose, the dilutions, the potentization. And here, uh, we're really struggling because we always face, well, it's impossible. You know, homeopathy is impossible because of the dilutions. So this is really what I want to talk to you about today. So, you know, to put it into perspective, in biology, you don't expect uh, anything to happen beyond a dilution 10 to the minus 10. So that's, you know, one followed by 10 zeros. So it's a big, big number. But, uh, and so that's at 5C, CH, you're already at that level. So anything beyond 5CH in standard biology, you would expect no effect. And we know that we can work very happily at 30 CH and, and, um, and, and, and have effects. So there's a big problem here. And just, I just want to tell you that 30 CH, just to put it in perspective and just to remind you, it's like taking a drop, putting it into the ocean, mixing the whole earth, taking another drop, putting it again in the ocean, mixing the whole thing again, and taking a drop. That's 30 CH dilution. This is how, just to give you an idea of how big the dilution is. Um, so, so we have a problem, really. <laughs> good, good. Uh, and then from the standard physics, so the, you know, we, we're always trying to, to go towards the idea, OK, then it's not uh, some kind of uh, remnant of the original substance. It, it has to be some kind of water structures. So, I, you know, I looked at this quite a lot because water structures was my PhD topic. So I can tell you that really in terms of the standard physics, we don't expect not anything much to be stable in water beyond 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So you know, you've got millisecond, microsecond, nanoseconds. They're it's really, really small. So we know that homeopathic potencies can be stable up to a year, and currently there's just no idea how that could happen. OK. So staying positive, what do we want? We want something, we want some kind of mechanism that can have a memory. We want something that is going to work through potentization, that we know that the potentization, the actual succussion process, is essential. So we need something that's going to work with that. And we need to, something that's going to be bioactive, something that we give back to the patient and is going to trigger some kind of, of reaction. So I want to tell you uh, about uh, so what I consider that we know, that, that are the ingredients I'm looking into to construct a theory. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about the nanoparticles. So I don't know how many of you have heard of our nanoparticles, quite a few. So I think it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I personally think there's some problems with it, which I'm going to show you. Um, but that's, that's uh, for today. And for tomorrow, I will um, tell you about my own kind of favorite theory that kind of is able to explain most of the things I'm going to show you today. So let's jump in. So there's a few ingredients uh, I want to tell you about. This, the, the fact that it seems that electromagnetic fields are involved, uh, and also then the, the idea of a crosstalk of field effects. I will tell you all, all what these things are. This came up a lot in Barcelona, a few um, researchers uh, confirming this effect. And then I'll tell you about some other parameters to do with uh, ultra-high dilution. Mm. So to start with, uh, I have to introduce you to uh, Montagnier. Montagnier uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2008 for HIV. Uh, and he has been secretly continuing the work of a Dr. Benveniste. Um, and basically, he published um, um, papers in 2009, just after his Nobel Prize, looking at uh, dilutions. And I'll show you some of that. Um, and he presented it at the Lindo presentation, which is the conference for Nobel Prizes. That is, 
Only if you have a Nobel Prize can you go to that conference. It's pretty intense. Uh, there was rumor that he was going to move to Shanghai, but that's kind of um, died now. So what did he do? Well, uh, it all started with an experiment he did where uh, he was um, looking at parasites of lymphocytes, uh, and it's, called, it's a bacteria called uh, Mycoplasma pyrum, and uh, he was studying the, 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 behave, the, the relationship between the lymphocytes and these parasites. So he filtered them out uh, using you know, smaller and smaller filters and uh, played around with you know, trying to see how, uh, how, how, how... Well, basically what he did is he filtered all the parasites out and then put back the solution with lymphocytes that had no uh, bacteria, and within two weeks, somehow, the, the, the bacteria reappeared. So that's very weird. Um, so he was starting to think, okay, so something in the filtrated substance, in the filtrated water, has been able to inform the, the lymphocytes such that the bacteria has reemerged. So he started to think, okay, so there's something here about information. So we, what he did then is he went back to the experiments by his friend uh, Jacques Benveniste. So I don't know how many of you know about Benveniste. Yes. Uh, so he's very famous for publishing the, the kind of nature paper in '88 about the memory of water. Uh, and he did, you know, he started the whole uh, thorough investigation of homeopathy using um, a, a phenomenon called degranulations. In, uh, which is a, 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 a allergic type reaction. Um, so he 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 started the whole this whole field, and and he was yeah director of the French CNRS before um, before publishing in '88. At which point he basically uh, lost everything, and when I met him, he was working from. Uh, a, a, a construction site, site shed in the parking lot of his old institute. So, that, you know, so they had a big, big institute, and he was allowed to work in a, in a cabin in the parking lot. Uh, so what he did, and he, what he, he put together an instrument, which is this one, which uh, he used, if you put a vial here into this apparatus, which is basically a coil, then you can measure the electromagnetic properties of your sample. So what you do is you put this into the coil here, and you have some kind of amplifier, and then you can record it on a computer. And then the computer um, can analyze the frequencies present in uh, the signal coming out of the sample. So, Montagnier, with his uh, bacteria, I thought, okay, there must be something in the water that I'm diluting, in the water that I'm using with my bacteria that must have some information, so let's look at it using this uh, apparatus. So he starts with the bacteria, filters it out, and then succusses it, so he uses a, 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 something called vortexing, which is basically the lab, modern lab equivalent of a succussion. So instead of shaking like this, it's kind of a machine that whizzes very quickly and shakes it like this. So he uses that instead of, of um, succussion. And then, he, so he does a series of dilutions and then succussion, but he uses actually vortexing up to a D12. So 12X. Are you, yeah, does it, yeah. uh, and then, puts it in the machine, and lo and behold, he can see a signal in, in the frequency domain. So th these are the frequencies, and here you can see a difference between the controls. So these are succussed controls and the actual, uh, um, the, so the bacteria that's been gone through this whole process. So there's something about, Electromagnetic information that's being captured 
through this process, although it's been, the bacteria has been filtered out, has been diluted and succussed, then uh, some information uh, is there. Now, uh, he's, he, he was able to show uh, that the succussion process or the vortexing was essential for this process. So if there was no vortexing, there was no signal. And also, he only gets um, the signal if he dilutes um, the, the, the sample. He says that if it's the sample isn't diluted, then there's just too much interference. I don't know, uh, but that's what he says. But basically, yes? So vortexing is another, uh, it's, I don't know if you've asked, yeah. The, yes, I just asked what vortexing meant. It's, so vortexing is another way of doing succussion. So the, the standard succussion process is up and down, but vortexing kind of goes like that. And it's in, um, in all the biology labs, you have a machine that does that. It's just when they want to mix something quickly, it just, so, and it's, it, it's quite violent as well. So it's quite a violent shaking that's similar to, to, to succussion. Yes? But it's done only once? It's done at every step. Yeah. And, he, and Montagnier showed that if you didn't do that, it didn't work. Um, well, actually, yeah, and I want to, so, actually, so then Montagnier went beyond that and he was able to show by breaking down the, this, this part of the experiment into all its, the bits of the bacteria, he was able to show that it was the DNA that was actually responsible for the signal. And then he was able to show that it was a particular part of the DNA, the part of the DNA that's responsible for a protein um, uh, that's responsible for being able, for the bacteria being able to connect to the lymphocyte. So it has kind of a, a membrane um, binding protein, uh, I think it's called co cohesin, that enables it to, uh, to bind to the lymphocytes and actually confer to it uh, its pathogenicity. So it makes it uh, able to, to cause harm. So that, so that stretch of DNA that codes for this particular protein is what gave rise to this particular signal. Um, so that he was able to show that. Anyway, so moving on. Yeah, so, and he was able to show that it didn't seem to matter much how many cells you had at the beginning. Um, as long as you succussed it, you, you got the signal. And it's also, as I said, he only found it in uh, high dilutions, or relatively high dilutions. Uh, so. 7x, 12x, something like that. Um, to put this in context, uh, this, he was not really the first to discover the, the electromagnetic signal in, 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 in biology. It was studied a long time ago by um, uh, Alexander Gurdjieff, uh, Gurdjieff, sorry, um, uh, with this, the biophotons, and you looked at them in the UV spectra. So, just to remind you, when I say electromagnetic signal in physics, electromagnetic signal also is photons. So, so light is an electromagnetic signal in physics. Um, does that make sense? Uh, and then it was also. Uh, investigated by Fritz Albert Popp, uh, and he found also that the source of the, the signal was DNA. So, you know, it's not the first time that this type of result has been uh, reported. <laughs> now, it seems so, taking a step back from these experiments from both Montagnier and Benveniste, it looks like we're able to detect the electromagnetic signal through the apparatus I told you about. This can be, then be recorded and, 
and, and actually right now Montagnier uh, is working on, on machines that would analyze the signal to be able to use it as a diagnostic tool for infections, for example. So if you have a blood sample, uh, you could analyze the signal and, and look, see if there's an infection. And then what Benveniste uh, uh, did, he actually uh, kind of recorded signal from a sample and then would play it back to a blank sample and was able to see that this informed sample had biological effects. So to me, it's just indications that this whole electromagnetic, um, uh, so there seems to be something to do with electromagnetism in the process that we're looking at. Yeah, so that's what I said. Now, so if the first ingredient was electromagnetic radiation. Now, there's another thing that came up, which is uh, the so-called crosstalk effect. And this is slightly different, um, all the, all related. Here, and, and to illustrate what I'm talking about, here it is. So if you, what Montagnier did, if, if you took DNA, so the DNA I was telling you about earlier, and you um, succussed it and diluted it up to D6, and you put beside it a, a water sample that's just blank, and you leave the two overnight, then 18 hours, and then the, the, the DNA sample shows the frequencies I was telling you about. It has a signal that you can measure with this apparatus. And then, but lo and behold, the water sample also has the same signature now. It has come, somehow caught on the information. Does that make sense? So th this is this is uh, these are sealed vials. So the you know the information somehow has passed from one to the other. Now other researchers. So this is now on uh, frogs. The experiments done by uh, Christian Endler in Austria. He's been looking at frogs, um, especially tadpoles, and how thyroxine thirty X can influence. Um, the, the development of, of, the, of the tadpole, and you can do that uh, very reliably now, and, um, and basically what he does is he counts the numbers of, of tadpoles that have gone to the, the four-legged stage. Uh, and you can do that, so experiments look like this, and um, you just look over time how many uh, tadpoles have reached a certain uh, stage of development, but what usually he would just put the thyroxine 1x into the bath with the tadpoles, and, and that would work. But here in this experiment, what he did is he put a sealed vial of thyroxine. So he didn't put the actual homeopathy in the water, he put a sealed vial into the water, and that was enough to create the effect. So there's a substantial difference between the two uh, groups. Yes? Uh, days, I suspect, yeah. Jag frågade just om tiden, om det var timmar, dagar, veckor eller månader bara. Yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about hours and day or days? It's days. I suspect it's days. I'm sorry, yeah. I will check it, but I think it's days. Yeah. Have they repeated that experiment with a Faraday cage around the tube? In other words, to actually block out the field? No. No. Okay. But the idea of the Faraday cage is a good one, yeah. I will, I'll mention something about this a bit later. Um, so, so that's uh, with frogs. Um, basically, you don't need to actually put the homeopathy itself, just uh, the proximity seems to be enough. 
So another researcher, uh, Stefan Baumgartner in Switzerland now, has been using plants. And what he's, so he also reported this in, in the conference in Barcelona, is uh, they've reported a very strange effect, which is that when they, they, they use, uh, they, they have plants that actually don't look like this. They're kind of, they put in little packets, flat packets, and then they stack them 10 by 10. So, uh, and they're like a, on a coat hanger. So there's got 10 of the placebo, 10 of a certain remedy, 10 of placebo, and so on. And it's all computer coded, so they know exactly. Uh, and then they looked at it in detail and realized that the placebo group, the plants that were in the middle of the placebo group were not affected, but the, the plants that were closer to the virum group, the ones receiving the remedy, were affected as if they were receiving the virum. And the effect is linear. That is, the closer the plant is to the virum group, that is the group receiving the, the, the homeopathic remedy, the more it looked like it had received the homeopathic remedy. And the effect is linear with distance. Not inverse square. I can go, why it's not inverse square? Because you know, there's, there's a reason why it's not inverse square. Um, yes? What can happen if I have a bottle or the arnica and a a very sharp question, but you'll, you'll spring a way, way ahead of my talk. So we'll discuss this, uh, but good. Uh, that, that's exactly where it's going. So, um, so there's a linear effect. So again, this is, uh, there's no reason to believe there's any uh, pollution or any, uh, it seems to be really some kind of field. And it's, you know, here the distances are centimeters. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at. All the experiments work on you know, centimeters, tens of centimeters max distance range. Um, yeah. Uh, so before I go there, so I just want to, to, to tell you, to, we also had in, uh, in Barcelona, uh, Gustavo Braco from Cuba who mentioned this effect. Uh, and he's noticed it when they, um, for example, they prepared a placebo at the same time as a virum, so they use uh, succussed uh, placebos. And if, if they prepared a, a succussed placebo at the same time as a succussed virum, the placebo would not be a placebo. So they have these machines that can do two things at a time. And they noticed that they had to make them really separately because if they did it at the same time, the placebo would not be a real one. So this is not published, but he told us in, in uh, Barcelona. So, so this is at least like four big groups in the world that are reporting this weird effect. So again, uh, what we have is we know that if you heat it or, or boil it, it, will, it doesn't work anymore. If you freeze it, if you freeze the water, it doesn't work. And uh, many studies have shown, well, a few studies have shown that if, if you don't have succussion or this vortexing, then it doesn't work. So um, what do we have? We have uh, dilutions, we have succussion, we have something that's bioactive at the end, we have this effect of crosstalk I told you about. We have something to do with electromagnetic information in something, some sense, and we know that you know, it's heat sensitive, that this, the, whatever's out, is created, is, is um, going to be quite sensitive to, to heat. So where do we go from here? Nanoparticles, as been hearing about, or my quantum coherent domains, that's for tomorrow. Today, I'm going to tell you about nanoparticles. No way. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just wonder, you started off with saying that the memory in the water would only be there for less than a second. Yeah. And, and to continue this, it just seems to, I need to understand that. Yeah, point. so I'm just, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit faster because I'm being told. Very good. That, I was just telling you that's the scale of the problem. We have a huge problem. Uh, so now I'm going to 
you know, now I've told you what we know, I'm going to try and resolve that by telling you about the type of theories that uh, are out there to explain it. Sorry. So nanoparticles, uh, a Indian group by Chikamani uh, discovered that there was gold nanoparticles in 30C and 200C. So they were able to, to detect those. So nanoparticles, any particle that's uh, about 100 nanometers, that's about the size of a protein. Uh, a big protein. Oh, well, no, no so a protein is more down here somewhere. But it's the size of a virus, say. And actually, they used this type of nanoparticles to treat cancer by binding uh, proteins on uh, the sides of these nanoparticles. So I want to show you quickly that the idea, one of the ideas they had is that the dilution process would actually uh, take the top layer of the remedy. And uh, so what they did here is that they show that the number of nanoparticles they're measuring doesn't change much up to you know, 11C if they take, take the top layer of each dilution. Uh, so it seems, you know, we know nanoparticles can be effective in, in biological terms, and we know through these experiments that in principle you could have kind of constant concentration of the nanoparticles if you do it in this very specific way, up to kind of 11C. Now, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. It, we know it's bioactive, you need it, you need succussions to create nanoparticles to, to extract nanoparticles from the glassware. And, uh, and we know that we can keep the concentrations of nanoparticles. So now, I, time is like running out so fast. Uh, so, uh, problems are, of course, that you need to, to dilute from the top layer, which is a big problem because we know in practice, uh, homeopathic pharmacies tell us it's not the way it is. And, sorry, and also, if you look at this concentration, that's about 100 um, micro, uh, nanogram per milli, milliliter. And to put the context to this, if you look at the biology papers, nanoparticles are bioactive at about 100 mi uh, micrograms, that's uh, 10 to the minus 4 grams. But orum uh, nanoparticles have been measured experimentally at 10 to the minus 10 micrograms. Um, and basically, for this <coughs> remedy, if you took orum to get to that level of concentration, you would need to drink 4,000 Olympic swimming pools. <laughs> to put it another way, if you were to uh, put one drop of a cough syrup into 40 swimming pools and take from that a spoonful, that's basically what you're doing here. Okay? You dilute it, like diluting into you know, a standard homeopathic, something like aspirin, you're putting it into 40 swimming pools, and you're taking a bit of that, and that's supposed to be bio biologically active. So, in my opinion, we still have a big scale problem. That is, the dilution problem is not gone away here. It's still very much present. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, I like the idea of the nanoparticles because it's bioactive and so on, but it still needs a lot of work. Now, okay. Uh, no, we need that. So, yeah, and the crosstalk, it doesn't explain crosstalk because it's not electromagnetic. Electromagnetic, it doesn't do, and it's not going to be very heat sensitive. So I see problems with nanoparticles, uh, and it needs uh, some, more, some more work for me to be convinced. And basically, this is the point where I'm going to leave you today. <laughs> Uh, because uh, tomorrow um, I'll tell you about the quantum coherence domains, which I hope uh, explains a lot of, or is able to explain a lot of the things I showed you today. So thank you for your attention. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, so please. Please come forward. You had a question there. Did you get it answered? Please stand up. And, uh, the what? Okay. That was the name of paper. Oh, sorry. Could you? 
Any questions? Yes. You want me to go over it again? Yeah. Uh, what does the word virum mean? Oh, uh, virum is, is in like all the trials. It means tr truth. It means the actual substance we are trialing. So it's kind of the inverse of placebo. So when you don't, you know, you said virum, placebo. Virum is whatever we're testing. The, the substance, yeah. And sometimes the substance doesn't quite capture it, so we use VRM. Yeah. Okay, um, it's not actually a question, but uh, what you are telling us about uh, how um, small amounts of uh, substances can affect uh, animals, like these small ones. That means, uh, I would suppose it, that's why even very small amounts of uh, environmental poisons can affect uh, living creatures so heavy even or what do you think about that uh, even if it's not very much because it's I mean it's a completely different field for me I mean like bees we know like they're being influenced a lot um, I mean more ho levels of hormones really uh, you don't need you know, they work at very very low concentrations what I'm interested in really in this talk is when you are, don't have anything there. When you're beyond a 12C and there's nothing happens. Because I'm interested in how homeopathic remedies work when there's not, nothing there that's, that could do it. So not a single molecule. Whereas, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Chris Jorgenfeld and I always feel very um, comforting by the fact that science today can only explain the 5% of the universe that consists of matter. And they, ha can, they have no idea what the other 95% are. Doesn't that comfort you? Um, interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it comforts, it's not a comfort, um, it's just a fact. Uh, and I think, uh, it's fascinating. That is, as a scientist, we need to be reminded all the time that we don't understand most of the stuff. And that's why we're doing you know, the process of trying to understand things. And as soon as we start to think, oh, I know the truth, that's when things go downhill. You know, if you assume you know, then you can't discover anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>